Welcome to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. I'm your host, Chuck Shoot. Very excited that today we have a special guest, Mark Gus Scott. He is the drummer from the band Trickster, and I'm very excited to have him on here. Even if you don't know who Trickster is or you're not a fan, I think after listening to this interview, I think you'll become a fan if you're interested in music at all, or especially rock music. He's got some great stories to tell, um, and Trickster was pretty big at the time in the 90s, so um, I think they still sound great. I'm, a, I'm still a big fan, so I'm very excited to have him on. So let's see if we can get him on the phone here. We'll just hang on one second, and then I'll give him a proper introduction, and we'll have him on the phone. Thanks, man. Okay, so my guest today is a classically trained musician who plays the trumpet, uh, piano, drums, and I also learned today that he can sing a little. He is most known for his work as the drummer in the band Trickster. With the band Trickster, he had a gold album that produced three top 100 Billboard singles. They were also uh, three number one videos on MTV. They toured with Poison, Kiss, Warrant, Firehouse, The Scorpions, among others. He has also scored music for the movie The Monkey King, put out a solo record, worked in sales and marketing for an amusement company, as well as he does charity work with the troops and the Hope for Kids International. Please welcome Mark Gus Scott to the show. Mark, how are you doing? Hi, Chuck. It's an honor to be here. Thanks so much for having me, buddy. And by the way, I need a new resume written. Can you help me with that? <laughs> <laughs> I am actually terrible with resumes, but I mean, probably because mine is so empty, but yours has a lot more than I have. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I used to flip burgers at Philadelphia Steak and Sub back in Paramus Park when I was 16. So I wonder if we should put that in there as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, you've been all over the place. So you were actually classically trained in music, Mozart, all those guys. You played the piano, the trumpet. Um, and then you, you grew up in the East Coast in a town called Paramus, New Jersey. And uh, I, Paramus, I heard that yes. Paramus, yeah. sorry. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I heard that your mom, she actually went to the high school that the movie and the TV show Fame were filmed at, and that she made you play the piano? Correct. She, uh, it, you know, it's kind of funny. She, she did make me play the piano. And, and for, for people that, I guess for people that, 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 that aren't into music, it's it, it maybe a, a little hard for them to relate. Uh, the, the piano have all, has the whole, the whole keyboard right in front of you. So the idea of getting to visualize the music that you're going to play. I think it's the only instrument. Guitar may come close because it does have a fretboard and I guess you could place it. But the, the keys of a piano is every darn note that's basically, you know, w w within music. So yeah. the, the advantage of seeing everything in front of you before you even play it is, 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 is something the piano offers that no other instrument really does to that extent. Yeah. Well, it's uh, funny because my, my parents made me take piano lessons and I hated it. But so you just kind of <laughs> persevered and then you ended up playing the drums, obviously. And, yeah, uh, but believe me, I, I was not into. I, I was like seven, eight years old when I started, and I really wasn't into it. I mean, it was kind of cool, but but uh, well, let me rephrase that: it wasn't cool. <laughs> it was like you know, I sort of just did it because that's what mom told me to do. Sure, but I wanted to take a stick and beat the crap out of a drum. Let Let's get real, right? You know, so and then I started taking with classical teachers, and I was like, uh, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't mind doing that now. I, yeah. You know, I forgot right. a lot of piano that I used to know when I was a little kid. Uh -huh. And, you know, because of a bad attitude or just rock and roll, you know. And, and I guess some guys become keyboard players. Yeah. And like uh, the Dave Bryan from Bon Jovi. Sure. He's one of the greatest pianists I've ever seen play. He's, wow. he's freaking amazing. And he's classically trained. That son of a gun can really play. Yeah. And when you put a rock edge on something like that, you become a dangerous force in music. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it, I really wish I had more talent on the keyboard that I was probably better when I was a little kid. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you obviously had the talent, so that kind of helped you go in with it. And then in high school, you got the uh, the scholarship, which I'm still confused how you got a scholarship as a sophomore, but you got a scholarship to the Univ University of Hartford's Hart School of Music. Um, yes, it was, a, it was a thing for excellence in music. The Hart School of Music at the University of Hartford, they have a summer youth music program. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you get on this thing, uh, there's kids from all over the country that go to this. Kids from Canada come in. And uh, it's an opportunity for high school kids that have musical excellence to get together, work under a great conductor, and work with the staff of, of the college. And you actually get college credit for attending the school in the summertime. I did it uh, uh, 
oh. for my sophomore, junior, and senior year of high school. Gotcha. So uh, we all got together and uh, we uh, put together a double album of classical music every oh. summer. So it, it was kind of cool. That was the mission. You had to come together, play, uh, learn, advance our skill, and then actually make a record, which was like the coolest thing. Yeah. So and, how, uh, and you said that um, like a lot of the kids that were in band were called were called names like band fag and stuff, but you were cool with everybody, right? The football players and everybody was like, oh, hey, Mark, how's it going? Yeah, it's kind of funny. Being in Trickster, <clears throat> I saw I saw the perks uh, early on. I joined the band. I joined Trickster when I was sixteen. Yeah, and uh, it was the kind. And I, I was a hot shot trumpet player at the time. Right. And uh, we used to wear those big white hats, you know, like yeah, big yeah, Q-tips yeah. on our heads. And as the band would be exiting the the field, we'd do it in a straight line, and we'd walk off the field. And the football players be like at the end, and you know, a couple of guys would be knocking the Q-tip heads on, on the freaking <laughs> on the band guy, yeah. and they go band fag, band fag, yeah. as, as you would walk by and whack them. But when they came up to me, they said, "Hey, Gus, how you doing?" And I got a pass, you know. What I mean? Yeah, that's awesome. Because, because yeah, I, I the thing in in high school was a weird thing. I kind of was the guy. I was like the variable. I kind of crossed over into the nerds. I crossed over to the jocks. I crossed over to the stoners. I was with the losers. I was with everybody. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Gotcha. And. It, it was just a social thing. No, I guess number one, I was a social kind of guy, but right. being in the band cer- certainly offered latitude to cross those lines. Sure, and absolutely. Uh, it was you know I, I wasn't complaining. It was cool, sure. you know. <laughs> so I so. love the story too about how you joined Trickster. So actually, they were called Raid back in the day, and you really wanted to be a part of it, but they already had a drummer. So you said you volunteered to be the lighting guy for the. I've never heard of a high <laughs> school band having a lighting guy. Is that pretty common? Or? Well, they well here's the thing. If the high school, if you're going to have a show at a high school, yeah, uh, they, yeah, they have lights. Sure, someone's got to flip them on and off. You know, that, so I volunteer. Yeah, that's so <laughs> smart because you got your foot in the door, which I think a lot of people nowadays with millennials and things, they just want to like they want to be the CEO of the company right away. They don't want to just start at the bottom. You were willing to be a lighting tech just to get your foot in the door. I think that's pretty cool. And then it ended up you working know, kinda, out. Kind of, you know, and here, here's here's a, you know, a real world uh, scenario. Uh, when I uh, uh, yeah, there, there was a time I wasn't with the band and uh, I started working for, uh, like you said earlier, amusement company, so to speak, yeah. indoor amusement parks and stuff like that. Uh, I could, you know, you, I, I went to a co- concept called Dave and Busters. Yeah, I was a national absolutely. sales manager for them for a little while and, uh, did, you know, did some pretty wild stuff. But, you know, you could be a king of one concept. You go to a new concept, something new that, that has an infrastructure. For instance, Dave and Buster's had 44 locations nationwide, each location doing in excess of $11 million. You know, it's a half a billion dollar company. Yeah. So you, the idea that you're going to walk in and start at the top, even if you had a fantastic track record, you have to learn why certain things like that work, right. how they have become so successful. And the idea of starting at the top and not knowing what the concept, what the special particulars are, what made the concept great. You're doing yourself and the company a disservice. So, like you said, to start at the top is unrealistic and also just foolish. Yeah, you want to learn those little things that you that that, that make the company special. I'm talking like starting with the mop bucket in the freaking kitchen. You know yeah. what I mean? So you start so as a like lighting guy, the bottom up. yeah, and then you played the drums, and then you guys, even as a band, you start at the bottom. But even in eight, so in '87, you were playing sold out cry uh, to sold out crowds with with bands like Skid Row and Kicks, but you didn't even have a record label yet. And then finally in '88, you got your first album recorded. You or recorded a demo, kind of like just having fun, which was never released. And then you guys ended up switching. Where, where, where are you getting this info? I mean, it's correct, but the just having fun thing, most people don't know that. That's pretty funny. Yeah. So, Isn't that what yeah. it was called? Well, 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 there was two things. We first did a demo in 86. Oh, uh, okay. Produced by the great John Christian Paramus, who was in a band, Messiah. He played with Ray Gillins uh, from Badlands. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a lot of real thick Jersey stuff here. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Real real goomba history <laughs> and, and and i'm i'm telling you what what an amazing thing to play on a demo for the first time and wow the songs were great and we made a little package you know it's kind of funny because we were still in school everything we did in school we tried to gear towards the band so when we made our demo we printed our cassette we, at the time it was cassettes oh, we, sure. we, we we printed our cassette inserts in graphics class we oh. uh, you know did did uh uh, printing or, or wood shopping and, and was all geared towards making logos for the band. We, you know, every, everything we did, we made flyers 
to, to promote shows. So, you know, we, in making the demo, we made a real product because it was a homework assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, it, it was kind of funny, but the first, the first demo, I don't think it had a title. It was just Trickster, and it was okay. a five-song demo. Then we did the Just Having Fun thing, I guess, and that was a di- bunch of different songs. Yeah. And, but and it, some yeah, of those, but in 1988, yeah. that's when we met our management, uh, Shark Entertainment, Joel Weinshanker and Ken Mako, and uh, that's when things started to happen sure. for us. And they recorded, I'm trying to think how many songs that we put, the, they, they, they made us do new demos to mm. shop for record labels, and I'm trying to, re- we didn't call it anything. It was just, the new demo, you know. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so then you finally got the, the, the record deal in eighty nine and you started recording. It was released in ninety and then the first tour the first big tour you guys did was was with uh Striper, which is a Christian metal band. So what's that like compared to other was it that much different? I mean people always think have these stereotypes in their head. <laughs> 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 they I I'm just catching I, I just have some iced tea in my mouth. Uh oh, the okay. uh <laughs> the first off, you know, it's funny when people say Striper, the Christian metal band. Yes, they are. But, you know, they had, I always looked at them as a band that had great songs that sure, when they yeah. played, I was happy. I was like, yo, you know, I used to, I, I used to practice their songs in my basement. Robert Sweet, the drummer was like a hero of mine. Yeah. You know, he was a fantastic freaking player. Uh, Michael Sweet sang like a son of a gun. Tim Gaines on bass and Oz Fox on guitar. I mean, we looked up to those guys like, whoa, you know, they were something special. Uh, so, to, you know, it, 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 going out with them, they didn't walk around and like, you know, put the sign of the cross on your forehead. Sure. They were like, hey guys, how you doing? You know? Did they wear those, uh, the yellow and, and black striped outfits on that tour? At the time they had green and black, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, uh, they, but they, they, they weren't totally like the yellow and black attack. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they were more lax about it, I sure. think. But the theme of the theme of the record, we were out, it would be, uh, Against the Law was was the name of the record they were promoting at the time. It was uh, 1990, end of 1990. Yeah, that's got to be super exciting. I mean, they were definitely a big band. And then you toured with Don Dawkin, and then your videos started getting, that's when they started getting Airplane MTV. Uh, Give It To Me Good was, it stayed at number one for five straight weeks, right? More, I think. Uh, oh. eight, I, think was, I think it was eight weeks, yeah. Give ah. It To Me Good was number one for eight weeks, I believe it was Jeez. on MTV. That's crazy. Yeah, but, you know, it's even crazy. You know, it's not how long it stays there. Well, I mean, I guess it is, but it's the the, the idea that we just made the countdown. I remember we debuted yeah. at number seven and we all looked at each other like, is this really happening? It was just so weird. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like we tried for, first off, we had, we didn't just get on MTV. We had a, we had a challenge when the record first came out. Uh, we went to major radio and you know, the bigger radio stations. And we were doing very well on, on something called Z-Rock. Back in the time, there was a big uh, uh, syndicate radio station across the country of several stations called Z-Rock. Mm-hmm. And that was a rock radio station, man. And we, we were knocking it out on that level. Uh, a lot of, a lot of the, what they refer to as P2s, you know, like album-oriented rock radio. Yeah. We, were, we were doing very well, very well. And unfortunately, we wanted to graduate to that next level, get on the big commercial hit radio stations. And we went to those big, like Z100 in New York or Pirate Radio in, in, uh, in L.A. So we go, we'd go and, uh, and uh, knock on their door, and they're like, oh, hey, we saw you doing well. What's MTV doing with the, with the song? And we're like, oh, shoot, we're not on MTV. We're screwed. Okay, so we go to MTV. We made a nice video. Bing, bang. We go, hey, MTV, play our video, play our video. We're, we're getting added on all these stations. Things are starting to rock and roll. We're moving along. Go, oh, yeah, it looks pretty good, guys. Uh, what's major radio doing with it? We're like, God damn it. Now what are we going to do? Hmm. You know what I mean? So I got to tell you, what the, the, big, the big next level break for us was getting an opportunity on MTV called Smasher Trash. Oh. And they put "Give It to Me Good" on a Smasher Trash, uh, and, and for people that don't know what it is, it's uh, an opportunity for the MTV will play the song, and then the host comes on and says, "Okay, that's Trickster. If you like it, call this number and say it's a smash. If you don't like it, call this other number and say it sucks or it's a trash." Gotcha. So you know, so you know, it's a weird position to be put in when you're letting someone else dictate your future, you know? Now, what would right. happen if the song came out and everybody said, oh, it sucked, these guys, blow, blah, blah, blah. my career could have been done then, yeah. right then and there, you know? Right. So That's scary. But, 
thank God. Yeah, we smashed it around 84%, I think it was. Oh, I, I can't remember the exact, nice. but it's in the 80s. So, yeah, and so that offered us the opportunity to get put into medium rotation. That means they okay. would play us, I don't know, a couple times a day or something like that. You know, I don't know exactly how much, but yeah. medium rotation is what they refer to it as. Well, that's pretty cool, you know. Very cool. Or at least we're on MTV. So yeah. guess what? Now that we're on MTV, we started to get some of that radio station playing. It started to grow. And maybe we started getting played a little bit more on MTV, and then something magical happened. We got on Dial MTV. We became one of the most requested videos of the day. And we entered the charts at number seven on MTV, on Dial MTV, the top 10 videos. Every every day they had a recap of what the top 10 most requested videos were, and we came in at number seven. And yeah. then uh, a couple of week, couple of weeks later, it was number five. And a couple of weeks later, it went up to number three, you know. And we were on tour with Don Dockin. Yeah. And, and so I think... And uh, our, <laughs> our manager comes in and sound check. And he goes, guys, we need to have a conversation. Everybody get back to the goddamn dresser. I'm like, oh, shit. I'm like, uh, uh -oh. and I, I, just, I just smashed a hotel room a couple weeks, uh, just a week before. And, and really? I said, oh, shoot. Yeah, so I, I, I was scolded for that. Uh -oh. So, you know, it's kind of funny. Even though everybody kind of worked for it. Well, management, you work with management. Sure. You, you know, but, and, and it's, but the thing is, they try, not that they permanently tried to make it, but we were very young. So the idea that we were doing this, I was 22 years old. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was the middle guy. PJ was freaking 16, you know. He was? Well, I didn't know <laughs> that. The, yeah. yeah, let's see. He was four years younger than me. So at Jeez. the time, maybe he was 18 that we were actually out touring. Okay. You know. So then you guys. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, he signed the record. He was 16 years old. Wow. So you guys, and then yeah. during this time, around this time, you recorded a song one mo time for the movie uh, if looks could kill with richard grieco i've always wondered about that with songs on soundtracks did they just ask you guys to record us did you have to watch the movie and then you know make the song <laughs> geared towards the movie or was it just like give us a song any song and we'll play it well in some instances when you do movie work yes they, they show you visuals okay. in this instance it was just steve and pete that uh, were in L.A., and I think somebody had an idea for something. They had it in with the uh, producer, and they said, we need a song uh, with this sort of catchphrase or something like that. There were, there were inklings that the, what they I, – okay. I wasn't there. I, I, yeah. I actually didn't play on the song. Oh, you so, didn't? Uh, it, it, no, but okay. they did with just Steve and Pete, and uh, because they did it, they put the trickster label on it. So okay. Whatever, Gosh. You know? Yeah, I think Edgar but, Winter played saxophone. I was like, you should have played the correct. trumpet or something. That would have been cool. <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, it was an LA session or something like that. And Steve and Pete, uh, Steve and Pete were around and they pulled it off and they just stuck the trickster label on it because okay. we were doing well. Sure. But so meanwhile, yeah, then your, yeah. your debut's climbing up the charts. The songs are getting played on the radio The you got three number one videos on MTV and then you end up opening for poison. So you got to tell me something with poison, like, cause they partied pretty hard back in the day. Right. I mean, I've, I've seen the behind the music. So what was that like? <laughs> Well, first off, the idea, but we got the call saying we were going out with Poison. That was that was a big thing for us. That was going to be our first arena show. So, I mean, we, that was the big dream come true. Sure. So, uh, we, 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 we get there, and uh, we're in the dressing room. It was really weird, you know, and it was, it was the big time. And Brett Michaels comes walking in our dressing room and goes, hey, man. And we're like, wow, dude, what's going on? You know? And he's like, well, I want to welcome you to the tour. Listen, after the show, uh, come to our dressing room. We have, like, a big dinner back there. And why don't you come have, guys have come dinner with us? We're like, get the frick out of here. Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> that's, like, the coolest freaking thing. Yeah. So we get to, need to say, we do the show. Everything goes great. We're in the, and I, we got to visualize. This is a little weird. The showers in, in, in the dressing rooms in the arenas, it's like one big concrete room with like 10 shower nozzles. So you're like showering all together. Oh, you, you know what I'm saying? Weird. That's yeah. how it's done. Like, you know, like, I don't know if you've seen movies where a sports team is, you know, yeah, in like the a locker, locker room. room after. Sure. Right. It's a locker room shower for the most part. That's, you know, nine times out of 10. That's what the showers are like at an arena. Huh. So, you know, we're, so we're the band. We're, we're showering after the show. And in comes Brett with these five strippers and they're all <laughs> carrying champagne bottles. And he marches the girls right into the shower while we're showering. Oh my <laughs> he God. Says, so he says, boys, welcome to the tour. <laughs> <laughs> Is this just like an average night or was this because like the, the welcoming committee kind of thing? 
You know, this, you know, it's kind of weird. It, it's funny when people always ask, oh, tell me a road story. Tell me yeah. a road story. And honestly, it, I, it's hard sometimes to just put it into story form because yeah. some kind of crap happened every day. Right. You know, it's like just another thing that happened. So, you know, but I mean, that one, I guess it's the first night of a poison tour. It was a very big night for us. And I got to tell you, Brett made the experience something special. Yeah. He made it something to remember he made i mean and it was a very big night for us and he knew it you know yeah and he, he knew what it was like to be in that position he pushed it over the edge to make it right to make it you know something so amazing that's and, very cool you know how cool was that yeah how i heard cool i've, was I've that? heard so many stories about how cool that, are you still friends with him i know he lived in arizona for a while i don't know if he still does he, but... he still has a home in arizona you very know cool. and he yeah he's uh, not far and i see him from time to time when he plays uh we we see each other we played shows together well, but, you know it's funny he actually gave us the, he, he helped tr- put trickster back together for the for when we got back it well uh, he, he yeah. i guess they, poison had a long-standing contract with clear channel and every time they came around they needed a new opening act mm. so he called one year i think it was 2006 oh. or something and he said hey uh, listen trickster why don't you come over for poison and we weren't together right so he says listen why don't you get your act together here's the number of my agent oh. Uh, give him a call and, you know, let's get something cooking over here. And you guys, maybe he'll represent you. So we call him. Guess what? He became our agent and, and our second show back was opening for Poison. Oh, that's awesome. So, so going yeah, back so, to, I, the, to the 90s, uh, then you end up opening for the Scorpions in Germany. <laughs> and this is a story I, th- I found no, kind of interesting. The Scorpions was a U.S.-Canada thing. We, <laughs> we didn't do Europe. Oh, okay. I wish we did. I but wish you did, did the Scorpions yeah. tour. And I guess this is a story I found was kind of interesting. So you guys had this kind of code, which I know they Poison did this too, but you guys had a code on the Scorpions tour that if you gave the roadie um, a, a, girl, a girl, if the roadie gave the girl a pass, they would always say it was left over from the Tulsa tour. So that was kind of like your code where, to know. Where did you that's get how... this from, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I did my research. I did my research. You, dude, you're, I got to tell you, you're good. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> you, uh, you, and, and yes, you are correct. You are accurate but you're giving away all the important information. <laughs> well, that's, that's not still not the code. I'm sure there's a new, away. yeah, there's a new code, but I, it's always interesting to, to hear stuff like that. So you kind of knew, all right, this is how the girl got the, so that stuff does go on like quite a bit, right? Well, the reason why we use Tulsa, here's the real reason, Tulsa, as in Tulsa, Oklahoma, if you spell Tulsa backwards, right. it spells a slut. <laughs> so yeah exactly so the, the so, funny part is you better watch your ass when you're actually playing tulsa <laughs> if you're playing yeah, tulsa, you're right. oklahoma that night all bets are everybody's off got a tulsa far. pass so yeah you need a new code you gotta for that be night. careful who you sleep with <laughs> yeah absolutely so so you did that tour and then the big one which i know we've, you've talked about this many times is the blood sweat and beers tour which i love the name of was 91 and uh, june of 91 i think it started with Warrant and Firehouse, and you've been quoted as saying this grossed more than the Whitney Houston tour, which kind of surprised me, but not really because that you guys were so big back in the uh, at that point. Um, so there has well, to there's be there's two factors. Yeah, I mean, as far as like the Whitney Houston comparison, the quote is true. Yeah, we did gross more, but but by the same token, we did several more dates than than Whitney did. Sure, you know, for every sure. one show she did, we would play five. Okay, <laughs> well that makes sense, but still, it's a good statistic yeah. to put out there, anyways. So yeah, so, so yeah, exactly. But what a special time that was. It really was a very special time. Right. So, and then you, I mean, there has to be some shenanigans on this tour too, because I mean, oh, I saw no. that church on a daily basis. <laughs> I ate the wafer or the body of Christ and so you, uh, you know, Hey, right. But have you seen the movie, the dirt? <laughs> I mean, was there, is that kind of stuff? Was it as crazy as the movie, the dirt with Motley Crue or is it tamed down a little bit? I mean, you're not under oath. You know what? You can change the names if you need to, but what's the wildest story you remember from that tour? First off, you're making comparisons to the dirt. The dirt is, well, there's, there's accurate reflections of what happened with Ozzy and, and with the, you know, Motley Crue. Sure. There's some accurate stuff in that movie. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'll say when it came to urinating on the ground and then trying to lick it up, we did not do stuff quite like that. <laughs> That's probably a good that thing. Be, yeah. That being, that, that being said, there was other stuff that we might've done that might've paralleled that sort of thing. Really? But you know, it, it well, yeah, but you know, when women's, you know, bodies are involved. It's, you know, you know, you, you get, you get some latitude to find that socially acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Sounds pretty crazy. 
So, we, we, you know what? It, 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 the, the real cool thing about that whole tour, we didn't think it would be as big as it was. Right. I mean, we thought really? it would be good. And, and here's a real funny story. Well, not funny, but an interesting story that a lot of people don't know. And and a part of me feels like I shouldn't even tell it, but uh, tell it. we got a call. We got a call from David Lee Roth. He said, "Hey boys, we want you to come out and tour with Dave this summer. It's going to be a great freaking pack." We're like, "Holy crap!" Now wow. Van Halen, they were our gods, the yeah. gods. So the idea of opening for Dave and I had just uh, uh, way before before church. I thought I actually worked for Dave at the Meadowlands Arena on his birthday as as like a roadie dude, oh. and he was so freaking. He was so nice. The guys in the band, Billy Sheehan and Greg Bissonette, were the nicest guys. It was crazy. Yeah. And uh, he even played. He played the Trickster demo tape backstage at his birthday party so it was like wow. it was so cool day yeah so i guess you know he kept us in mind or something and yeah. so we were moving up he said we you know guys come on open for david lee roth and we were like holy cow we're gonna open for dave i can't believe it i can't and then warren called mm. and warren it said listen we're putting this together it's gonna be warren trickster firehouse let's go out and we're like dude we're going with dave we're going with dave yeah. and our management said whoa 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 boys Let's have a talk about this. And we're like, how do we mean have a talk? It's David Lee Roth. How could we not? Blah, blah. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we were listening to our management and, and good management. This is a lot of people don't understand why you have a manager. And here's exactly why you have a manager. And we had a good manager. He said, boys, David Lee Roth, even smile, kicked ass, love them. Yeah. And did very, very well. The next album, Skyscraper, not doing so well. Uh oh. You know, he, yeah. they really, he, he needed a strong opener. And I guess that's why he called. We, you know, we, we were, we were the best new band about hit parader magazine. We, we, we were arguably one of the, one of the, one of the top opening acts you can get. Yeah. You the had time. the uh, metal edge yeah. spectacular. That was an entire issue de dedicated to you guys. Right. Yeah. We, yeah, we were very, very fortunate. Things are going well. So management sits us down and says, you know, Hey, uh, warrant has got a new cherry pie record kicking ass yeah firehouse hot great. off the presses they're right out of the box they got a top 40 hit with the uh, don't with don't treat me bad and that love of a lifetime was in the bullpen about ready to freaking bust wow. you know like and you guys you have three number one videos on mtv now do you know what kind of package this is going to be this is this is target marketing to the demographic of people that buy that stuff and, and you know what management was right yeah. our heart said Dave, 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 how could we possibly uh -huh. consider someone else? But you know what? From a strategic standpoint, from analyzing the situation, that's what a manager does to direct the band in the right way. Because you know what? It ended up being the best goddamn tour of, of 1991. Yeah. And it, it was, it helped me buy my house. So, you know, it's <laughs> nice. like, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, a lot of people don't understand the back stuff. And I think that's right. what's important to shed some light on. Absolutely. And, you know, people make that mistake, those mistakes today. And I see it and it's like, what the hell are you yeah. doing, man? No, that you was know, a great decision. To have an objective viewpoint, yeah. to have great guidance is such a valuable thing to have, man. And mm -hmm. I got to tell you, we, we had to, we, we didn't do it by ourselves. We had a lot of help along the way. Yeah. And we were very, very fortunate in that regard. Very cool. So, then um, after that tour, then you ended up uh, in October, I think, of 92. You, you finally released your second album, which was called Here. And I love that single, the first single, Road of a Thousand Dreams. Were you kind of surprised, like, MTV, did you guys even make a video for it? Because MTV didn't play the video. The song didn't really do much on the radio. Were you kind of surprised? Because I think it's a really good song, really melodic, really great opening. Like, Let me tell you, something very interesting happened between 1991 and 92. Uh, we, uh, we, we had three number one videos in MTV, the third one being surrender, right? It debuted at number two, went number one in the first two or three days. And it was number one for two weeks. And it was the big crossover hit, the rock power ballad, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a good song. It was a great yeah, song. Great song. But the, something very interesting happened. One day we were number one on MTV and the next day we were off MTV. Right, because and they the, cut the program, right? They cut Dial MTV. They killed Dial MTV. The top 10 countdown was abolished. So strange. And I'm, this, we were the last number one video to ever be played on MTV. Huh. We, were, we died at number one. So the weird part is this was during the Blood, Sweat, and Beers tour with Warrant and Firehouse. Right. So the, imagine this scenario. We're selling out places like the World Amphitheater in Chicago, 33,000 people in an amphitheater sold out 
and MTV is not playing your video. Hmm. How the hell does that happen? Right. That well, doesn't make much sense. It happens. It, it freaking happened. So the weird thing is be standing on stage. Everyone's going freaking crazy. And MTV won't play your video. It's like, what, what, what do we do? Did we sleep with somebody's daughter or something <laughs> like that? You know, we, we, I swear to God, we were scratching our heads. And, you know, the check's coming in and, and we're yeah. rolling from town to town and everything's going wonderful. And we look, we're on the radio stations and, and MTV gave us the shaft. And it wasn't just us. Yeah. It was everybody. If you look at that period in time, right. look at Bon Jovi, look at Def Leppard. They had uh, albums like uh, Bon Jovi had Slippery Wet, then they had New Jersey. Their next album was Keep the Faith. Keep the Faith what do you yeah. think their sales difference was between uh, New Jersey and Keep the Faith? Oh, for because sure, they yeah. Know, they, in America, they did not have the support of MTV. Same thing with Def Leppard. They had, uh, what the heck was it? They had uh, uh, Pyromania, then Hysteria. And then, you know, after that, they, they had a reduction in sales of about 70%. Yeah, jeez. So, now, Trickster, that sold a million records, roughly, when you lose 70% of your sales, you know, that that's like a very substantial, in any business. Right. You have a 70% 70 decli 70 decline inside of a year. Mm -hmm. you, I, you, you, be you better freaking get your act together or, or something. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, we, uh, we it, was a, it was a big hit. And, I mean, it was a big, you know, negative knock. It was right. bad. Well, yeah, because I remember uh, the whole industry changed. Yeah, so I'm a little bit younger. So it's actually funny because I didn't really get into this kind of music until I was in about eighth grade, which was like 91, 92. And I just started mm -hmm. getting into it. This girl played a Skid Row record and I love, I was like, this is amazing. And then I started getting into like Trickster and all these guys. And then, and, I, and this is funny because I was living in Seattle in the, in this, it's at this time. So I was living in Seattle in the nineties and I was getting into poison and trickster and, and all this kind of, uh, hard rock music. And then but you grunge were the, you were was the, the X factor over there. That's, oh, that's interesting. I, I totally <laughs> was. And I was always, I was always looking when some of the bands were still touring in the nineties, but they would never come to Seattle. So it was just, it was frustrating for me at the time too. But then there was kind of a resurgence later on, um, but anyways, going back to 92, so you, you released that album anyways, and e regardless of how it was doing or whatever, you still got an opening shot with Kiss. So tell me about that, because yes. I know you're a big Kiss fan, and you got to hang out with Gene Simmons and eat uh, dinner with Gene Simmons all the time, and I mean, that are you still in touch with him at all? Are you guys still friends, or...? You know, I haven't seen him in a long time, to be honest with you. But I got, you know, it, it's really strange. I, I guess at, at a certain point, I, you know, I, I left the band and, and I started a new life, and I kind of you know, didn't, didn't keep in touch with many music people at yeah. all. So it's been a long time since I've seen Gene. Uh, but I, I remember do, touring with them and getting close with him was something very special to me. I mean, Gene was one of my big idols. And he, even though he might not have been a drummer, there was something about his character that I sure. truly identified with and, and whatnot. And I got to tell you, the, uh, the, you know, getting friendly with him and hanging out with him was a really, really cool. And I thought even just as a person in private, he was really a cool guy. Yeah. I actually and, read uh, his, always looked up yeah, I read his book the other day about power or something. It's really, it's a short little book, but he's a smart guy. Real, not only musically, but like as a, from a marketing standpoint, he knows how to market his band and, and uh, the brand of kiss. I mean, it's huge because yes. of it. I think he's kind of in ways you got to say he's kind of a marketing genius, really. Yeah. So, I, and I think, you know, I, I, I think there's also a factor. A lot of people tend to overlook and it's a weird factor. It's the factor of putting your balls up. Uh, and and I, I'm trying to find just the right way of saying it sometimes. And, and I've learned this more as becoming, let's say, a solo artist. And, you know, it's kind of weird, I guess, for you to even say that. I never wanted to have that strong ego. It's like me, 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 me. Right. I, 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 I'm not that kind of person. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something. If you want to be fucking Madonna. You better fucking step out of the limo first and tell everyone else to get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Exactly. So, you, you see what I'm saying? Now Absolutely. that's a weird character. Yeah, that's a weird character trait to possess when you're really not an egotistical bastard. You don't have to be an egotistical bastard. There's a fine yeah. line between promoting right. your brand, yes. placing your brand first, and being a, a son of a bitch about it. Exactly. So, you know, I agree. That's so, why. I, you, yeah. yeah. That's why I named my, you wanna my, be my a podcast. Michael Bolton. Yeah. yeah. You want to be a Mariah Carey. You want to be that next level. You want to be Phil Collins. Let me tell you something. If your if your album says Phil Collins, no jacket required, then you must promote Phil fucking Collins. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And to some people, you know, you think of it, it's, it's a fine line between egotistical and strong brand. Yeah. So I think Gene Simmons is in tune 
with pushing the brand and you know it, it, you know people joke about it now because he, you know he certainly can blur that line yeah <laughs> well like, remember that one time there was a video of somebody interviewing him and the guy was wearing an iron maiden t-shirt and gene simmons like you need to take off that iron maiden t-shirt and put on a kiss t-shirt <laughs> I mean, I was like, is he serious right now? Like, he, I mean, he's kind of funny about it too. Oh, so yeah, he, cool. he probably was. Yeah. yeah. So. But, uh, <laughs> I would venture to speculate he was. Yeah. So then going back uh, to the nineties. So then, um, you know, that album wrapped up. Uh, so the nineties, obviously was a little bit a rougher time. So you guys ended up uh, parting ways with your label. And then you, you did an independent album in 1994 called undercovers, which was basically a covers EP, which I love by the way, I, especially as a, as a younger kid, some of those songs I wasn't familiar with. So you kind of brought those songs to my attention. Um, but you covered one song that I did obviously know was a uh, fight for your right to party by the beastie boys. <laughs> and there's a line in that. And I think you sing some of that, right? You sing on I, I, well, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, what, what, it, it all started when we were on the Warrant tour, particularly. Uh, we 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 were our first tour was 13 months long. We did about 312 shows in 13 months. Wow. So we got and we pretty much played the same songs every night. So I, after a while, we're like, dude, we got to mix this up. We got to keep it fresh. So we did something crazy. Uh, we switched instruments. PJ would yeah. play drums. Steve would play bass. Pete would play guitar, and I was the singer. <laughs> so we went out and we said, what, what song could we do? I'll change this. And we did two. We did rock and roll by Led Zeppelin oh. and we did by fear, right? to party. So it, it was just a weird thing yeah. that we started doing. So on our own shows, we would uh, go out and we even did in the arenas where we would switch oh, instruments once that. in a while. Oh, it was freaking That's nuts. So it was cool. crazy. So there's a line yeah, in that and- song. <laughs> Um, there's a line in the Beastie Boys song that says, Mom, you're just jealous. It's the Beastie Boys. But you, now who came up with this? You changed the line to, Mom, you're just jealous because Daddy likes boys. And I thought that was so hilarious. Okay, first off, first off, it, it, it was a transformation. It started first as the Beastie Boys line. Okay. And then we did it on the road with Warren Firehouse. Yeah. Every night, all three bands would come out at the end and do Fight Fear Right to Party. And Janie Lane changed the words to, it's Firehouse, Trickster, and the fucking Down Boys. So, oh. you know, we had to make the line rhyme. So when we recorded it for our own uh, record, oh, for the Undercovers yeah. record, we had to, we changed it. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I, I, I'm not the one that came up with it. But oh, that's, that's awesome. Some, but I got it. So no, you just I mentioned, it but... <laughs> you just mentioned um, uh, Janie Lane. Uh, and I yeah. got to say, like, I was so bummed when he died, because I never got to see Warrant with Janie Lane. Cause again, I grew up in the Seattle in the nineties. They never came. Uh, I did see him with the other singers, but uh, were you close with him or did you, did you, were you sad when that happened? I mean, obviously you were sad, but were, I mean, were you, was it hit you pretty hard because you were close with him or is he kind of more just someone you hadn't talked to in a long time? Or? Well, no, you know, it, first off, it, it, the, the time that we spent with him in the nineties, it was a long time before that his passing. Uh, yeah, when we, yeah. when, in, and when we were touring together, Jane and I were pretty tight. We, uh, uh, we, we, he, he taught me how to drink tequila. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, uh, he, I mean, he was a generous guy. He led the party. He had that, you know, we talked about uh, the, the fine line between promoting your brand. He, he, he was that strong ego, the leader, the one that, 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 that said, you know, uh, yeah, he, follow me, fellas. You know, he was the general that went out on the horse in front of the troops. And instead of being the guy in the back sipping tea, pointing his finger for everyone else to go, he was the guy that rode out on the horse and said, follow me. You know, that was him. <laughs> uh, that was his attitude. Yeah. So I got to tell you, man, uh, I've never seen anyone party as hard as that and then get out on stage and kick everyone's ass. He, 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 and every, let me tell you something, dude, we did a lot of shows together and every night he would walk out there, no matter how much he had to drink the night before, how much he smoked or whatever, he would get out there and he would kick fucking ass every night. He didn't cop out on the high notes. He sounded great. He not, he, he, in that regard, he was, supernatural kicking so, ass. Oh. So I just caught up with him basically is what happened. As you get older, you can't well, do that as much, right? I, I think, I, think I, I, I wasn't there, but I think later in life he had some demons. And oh. I think at a certain point, I think, I, I think a lot of us flirt with this sort of thing, yeah. uh, but, but some people more, more than others. And I think at a certain point you have a lack of caring. 
Yeah, and uh, it's a very sad thing. It was yeah. a very sad thing. It was sad to hear and, that uh, he, he he hated the song Cherry Pie. I love that song. I love that whole record. It, and I didn't know the whole story about it, <laughs> how his management or the uh, record company made him write that, that he didn't really want. He thought the record was done without it. And then they made him go back in and, and finish that song. And then it created, it became a huge hit and he hated it. He resented that. That's really interesting to me. Let me tell you, you know, it's a weird thing and it can be a personal thing for an artist also. But it's a lot of times, you know, like I told, we talked about management and, and it's yeah. perspective. And I think, you know, there's a big difference between having a hit single and having a great song. They are yeah. not necessarily synonymous. Sure. You, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So to have the objectivity, like, like how many, I don't know if you're familiar with a band called Green Jello. Oh, that absolutely. That had a song, Little Pig, Three Little, little Pig, Let Me In, yeah, Not yeah. By The Hairs Of My Chinny Chin Chin. Now, someone came up to me and said, Gus, you got to record this, dude. It's going to be a freaking top 40 hit. Yeah. I tell him, get the fuck out of my house. You know? <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so you see my point, all right? So when, so when you walk hear, up to uh, Danny Lane, who has credibility. The, yeah, you're not going to be doing a cover of the Macarena or anything anytime soon. <laughs> well, that, that I would consider, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you know, So I, I'm just looking at it from a standpoint of being a guy like Danny Lane, yeah. who yeah. has credibility, who has hits yeah. under his belt. And then a record company says, you got to do this. And, and it's, she's my, ch-. no, yeah. I don't want to knock the song. I mean, I like the song too, yeah. but I could see it from his perspective. You yeah, know? he was, so, and, I think he's know, underrated. It's a, it's a weird thing. He's an underrated musician. I mean, he, I think he was a musical genius in my opinion. And some of the best songs he wrote, like Stronger Now, no one's ever heard that song. And I think it's, I think it's like genius. I think it's great. But yeah, there's just, it's just one of those things where he got labeled in that, as the cherry pie guy, as he said, maybe that's what kind of hurt him too. And they, they got, you know, Dude, let me tell you, if people dig deep into what Warren's music was all about. Uh, I, I think you're going to hear something that's special. And what I, what do I mean by that? A lot of the melody lines that you hear, what, what makes a great song. Mm-hmm. And again, we, there is a difference between a hit song and a great song, but it might've been hits like cherry pie to get, let's say a warrant on that upper national international scale of, 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 of you know, headlining artists kind of thing or, right. or that kind of recognition. But it's the depth of the stuff that they did that were maybe weren't hit as big as cherry pie, but, Things like Sometimes She Cries. Oh, yeah. Or Song and Dance, man. I mean, it, there's some beautiful the, b- blind faith. Of like yeah, the melodies. Stuff. But also the lyrics. He was a really good yep. uh, song yes. lyric writer, yes. I think. So Absolutely. Yeah. I but I, at the end of the day, and, and everybody had their country. The, the whole band's freaking fantastic. Yeah. Joey Allen, freaking Jerry yes. Dixon, Eric Turner, yeah. Stephen Sweet. Let me tell you, these guys were a cohesive unit. And they went and they kicked ass every night. And now they're with Robert Mason. He's yeah. a good friend of mine. He's a great singer. Got another fellow I think, being a Phoenician. Yeah, I was going to say he lives in Arizona too. So, dude, let me tell you something. That son of a bitch has got pipes. Oh, I know. Robert is yeah, a was son a, of a bitch. He was in Lynch he, he Mob really too. Is. And yeah, dude, yeah, he has, he's he's one of the top singers in the industry. <laughs> you know yeah, well, no. he sang with everybody. He's and all the newer stuff he's doing with the end machine. Holy crap! Oh that's yeah, that's really the one with uh, the guys from Dokken, right? Or George Lynch is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I want to hear that. Yeah, it, it's like Dokken without Don, and yeah. they got Robert Mason. Right. And dude, Perfect. he kicked it in the ass. I bet. I yeah. mean, like it's a fantastic. Yeah, I even Warren now with Robert. Let me tell you something. It's freaking fantastic. Yeah, he's absolutely. Not good. He's freaking fantastic. No, he's a great and singer. We played yeah. shows with them more recently, and oh, what's fun guys too. Yeah, but you know what? Yeah, there was always something special with Janie, absolutely, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, it, yeah. it's sad to see anyone go under any circumstance. And you know what? He was a friend, and it's a, yeah, yeah. I guess it's a little weird. It was you know? sad. I just I wish I could have seen him with with uh, with Warrant. But anyways, getting back you know, to you know, the... go on YouTube. There's a there's we did a pay per view oh, concert yeah. together in Lafayette, Louisiana, and Janie kicks ass. <laughs> I've seen a lot of the YouTube. So <laughs> you want to uh, get a taste of it? Watch that. Watch yeah. that video. Absolutely. So going back to the the '90s. So this is kind of the tail end of the band. Um, in '95, then you guys finally break up for a little while. So I was always curious about this. Um, this is kind of out of the out of the left field a little bit, but um, with song royalties, because you know you guys obviously quit, but you're still getting some song royalties. Do you get a piece of the song royalty as the drummer because you didn't obviously write a lot of the songs, or how does that work? I've always wondered. Well, there's that. different kinds of royalties right off the bat. Yeah. There's royalties for production. There's royalties for performance. There's royalties for writing. Mm-hmm. So. I being being a performer on the record, then I got a piece of it. Maybe not the lion's share of it, but the a piece of it, yes. And you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Unless you have a super huge hit, uh, 
it's not a lot of money. When things are going good, yeah, it yeah. can be very substantial. Sure. But you certainly make more, as far as the money aspect, you certainly do much better with T-shirt sales and concert ticket sales. Oh. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, especially like, at this point what, now. What's, because, the, what's yeah. the famous line from Spaceballs? Merchandising, 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 <laughs> where the real mon- money from the movie is made. Oh, <laughs> right, totally. So, so that's yeah, when you kind so, of, yeah, you guys took a, and then you took a hiatus and you started working for that amusement company. And then 2007 rolls around and you guys decide to get back together. And then you end up making two new albums, one uh, 2012 new audio machine, 2015 human era. I think the production and the songwriting uh, just continue to get better. In my opinion, I finally got to see you guys in 2009. You were, you played at the, De- I think it was 2009 desert invasion here. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. Well, um, hell yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember so, that. And that's uh, when yeah. you, <laughs> you well. played with some other, uh, what, what was termed hair bands. And I remember the nineties, all metal was called, uh, where, where I was from in Seattle, all metal was called butt rock. Like it didn't matter if it was poison or Megadeth. What? Everything was wait, called wait, wait, wait. back it up. Butt rock. Yeah. Have you never heard that term? No. <laughs> yeah, so that, it's like, so I, I wonder what your your thoughts on like hair metal, butt rock, all these terms. Do you have, like are you offended by some of those terms, or do you love them, or do you hate them? I mean, uh, I, I, I must say, butt rock has me a bit. You've uh, never heard that before, I'm really? Asking. See, that must have been I, a Seattle I swear, thing. I really don't think I've heard of butt rock now. Yeah, that must and have been I a Seattle thing. Never thought it was. I never thought of a hair band genre. Uh, being compared to a butt rock, I, 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 I'll be honest. I don't think I. Yeah. Which I think is funny, but uh, whatever. Yeah. Honestly, if I didn't like it, you blow it off and it's like whatever. You know? Yeah. And to be honest, with you, we never considered ourselves hair metal. I mean, I guess it's a term that's come to popular, you know, uh, recognition. Right. So you know, whatever. I what, we used to call it like arena rock. Yeah. We used to call it. We just. We used to call it. We're just gonna go play now. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't call it anything. It's freaking trickster. We yeah. just played. You know. And right. I don't know. But but I, you know, we did what we did, and yeah. it, it fit a certain genre, I guess. Sure. And I guess it, it's a good idea to to think about what genre it is, because I guess you know when it comes to demographics and marketing, you know, it's a good idea to to have a target. Yeah. So to me, it just sounds know, like yeah. melodic rock. I mean, it's like trick. Cause yeah, Trickster is very different than too. Skid Row or Motley Crue. I mean, in my opinion, Skid Row is a little harder. You guys are a little more popular, Agreed. but I mean, it's melodic Agreed. hard rock. So of all the bands and musicians that you've toured with, who was the most fun? I got, well, one thing is for sure that blood, sweat and beer store, <laughs> <laughs> man, I got to tell you what we, I think the reason why it was so fun, we knew it was going to be good, but we didn't know it was going to be that good. Yeah. And to, to, to share that experience, all three bands together, we really all became very close, very tight. We were brothers, sure. uh, you know, and now we're brothers like 30 freaking years. That was basically 30 years ago. Yeah. Let me so let's figure that how, how it was 1991. What year is this? 19, 19, 2019. 28 years ago? 20, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I can't even believe it. I mean, how crazy is that? And we played shows more recently with these guys. Yeah. So why not so do, can you, have you guys thought of doing a Blood, Sweat, and Beers part two tour? Like the three of we you? We kind of did some of that. We, we, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I, I would do the whole goddamn thing all over again. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah. the, uh, the, the we did do some shows and we build it as such where it was Warrant, Trickster, and Firehouse. You know, we did that. And, and, cool. and that was cool. But I got to tell you, I, I think we should have really knocked out. Who knows? Maybe two years from now for the 30th anniversary, ooh, ooh. I'm going to get a phone call, right? That's and we'll a good see idea. what happens. We'll I mean, put that I would, out hell yeah. yeah. Ra- rape the planet part two. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you're a fan of Van Halen, Kiss, ACDC, a lot of those um, hard rock bands. What do you, is there anything that you're currently listening to, like newer bands or anything that you're or you just listening to older stuff or? You know what? You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest. I don't listen to a lot of show. I, I, I hang out with Pete Lauren, our singer, a lot. Sure. He's in, he's, he's in, he's in the uh, Phoenix area. Georgia Chrome and uh, Smashed, a couple of local bands. And, here. Yeah, he, he used to be. Now, yeah, and now he's doing some solo stuff. Oh, okay. But, uh, and, and actually, he helped engineer my stuff. I, I got to tell you, I'm inept in, as an engineer, and he is very well versed so <laughs> he, I, I need his help he helped me a lot with the, with that side of things very cool. but we hang out and one thing we listen to music and and and, uh, and stuff and we have a very eclectic weird taste but i gotta tell you something i listen to a lot of 70s stuff we listen to that together uh and this may sound a little weird 
we had the Bee Gees on the other night. And, <laughs> you know, now uh, we don't just listen to the music, but we analyze it too. Yeah. And dude, when you listen to the production value of what the Bee Gees had going on back then, yes. you're like, holy crap. People don't necessarily realize the genius, the, how awesome, it, you know, that, what they what they did back then, how they, and it, it, like the early 70s, yeah. knocking out that kind of stuff. It's like, holy crap. Well, and sonically, it was yeah. really just amazing. So we, we, we don't just listen, we, we do this analyzation thing. We're like, holy, and, and it just so totally increases the depth of the pleasure of how much we really love listening to that music. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, and I, then it goes crazy. Yeah, my, my buddy it's on a, my other podcast, the Chuck and Josh podcast, Josh, he's a, he, he's a Bee Gees fan, and he told me that it's interesting about the Bee Gees is that they were big in the 70s, and then people hated disco, right? So they they basically went underground, sort of, and they still made a bunch of hits, but they just wrote the songs, and they weren't called the Bee Gees. So if you look back on, on some of the songs that they've written, they made a bunch of more yeah. hits in the 80s. They just didn't call it the Bee Gees. They called them, they were, you know, had other artists perform for them. So. Right, that, and that's the smart. Let me tell you, again, adding to the genius of who they really were. Yeah, <laughs> very smart. And, and let me tell you, companies do that today. Procter and Gamble, stuff like that. They they have one brand, let's say a Colgate, but then they have the secondary brand that that's positioned towards a different market, but it's the same damn product. Exactly. You yeah. know what I mean? I so, mean companies do that all the time. Absolutely. Have you ever did you ever listen to the band Steel Panther? I'm a huge fan of theirs. I don't know if you've ever seen them. <laughs> they are Dude, so- let me tell you something. They, they, uh, particularly in today's marketplace. They are the number one hair metal butt rock, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you know, they're, they, they, where, where yeah. other, and here, this is very interesting where other bands say, Oh, there's no place for that sort of yeah. music anymore. It's old. It's past. Hey, well, guess what? These guys took the joke and turned it on everybody else. Exactly. They kicked everybody's ass. They're out there pretending to be someone else that they're not. And they're succeeding at doing so. And they're yeah. doing it on a big, big way. And I, I applaud them. I, I think they kick them. ass. You yeah. Know? Have you ever seen them live? Absolutely. Every I've seen them live like twenty or thirty times, and every time it's a different show. The comedy in between the songs is hilarious. Yes, they and got dude. They great. got they got shtick. They they got they got personality. They, you know, I, I again, I applaud them. I really do. I, I can't say I'm all familiar with all their songs and stuff like that. I have heard them, and again, I applaud them. I think that you know to be that entity is hysterical. And, yeah. and to write the, the lyrics in the songs, I mean, the, the whole character of what they got going on, they're pushing it way over the top, and that's freaking the way it ought to be. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? So for that kind of guy, they're killing it. Killing it. Yeah. So I, I think I, 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 there's so many new bands out today that I'm like, what the hell are you guys doing? It's right. Like shit and how that's, is this even popular? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Panther? God bless you. Yeah. Go, so that go, was my go, next go. question is uh, <laughs> like, what do you think of the music scene in 2019? Like, what's your opinion of EDM, electronic dance music, and just the overuse of electronic drums and music? Because I listen to even some of the normal rock bands. They're all using, you know, I think Blink-182's new song, I feel like it's electronic drums. And I'm like, why are you using electronic drums if you're in a rock band? Like, what, what do you, what's your take on all that? Well, first off, if somebody has a creative energy and they, they want to do a certain thing, then that's their prerogative. And we don't have to like it. We can listen to somebody else, yeah. you know. But I, I, I think there's a lot of creative stuff in all forms of music. And I'll be honest, I'm not a huge dark metal fan, but there's some stuff where, where I can hear the virtuosity in some of these people playing. And I, I, have, I must say, I have respect for it. Yeah. You know, I won't necessarily go to the shows and buy the records and stuff sure. like that. But I, I certainly acknowledge that not everybody's taste is exactly like mine. Right. So there's stuff out there for different people, you know. Absolutely. Uh, EDM, stuff like that. It, let me tell you, some of that stuff I dig, hmm. you know, I like. But what, you know what's funny? In rock and roll, drum sounds versus, let's say, a disco or electronic, there's some big drum sounds. And when you, they drop the beat on you, dude, that's some heavy shit. I love heavy beat. I love to freaking feel that kick drum kicking my ass. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like even house music or, you know, I've been to a couple of raves and man, when the freaking bottom end's kicking my ass and everybody's bouncing, there's nothing like the energy in a room where everybody's having a great time bouncing up and down, going crazy, getting naked. I mean, psh, come on, I'm in. You know, okay. <laughs> Very cool. and sometimes it's not hair metal that does it for me. You know, it's, you know, it, it, it's something else that makes that room move. Absolutely, and I think that's an amazing sensation. Absolutely, you know, it's uh, and and you can, honestly, I can't listen to hair metal twenty four hours. No, a day. no, no. I mean, I so, did, I guess, when I was younger. Yeah, absolutely, and I still, I still crank up, uh, you know, uh, Unchained by Van Halen in my car, and I rip ninety five down the freaking highway. Yeah, yeah I, of course I do. So, you know, I. I yeah, that, that but, brings yeah, me to my different stuff yeah. out there. But I yeah. got to tell you, I think in today's marketplace, there is a lack of great 
account. And I shouldn't say, you know, I'm hesitant to say there's a lot. I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty selective. And I don't see a lot that really turns my head. Mm-hmm. But some of the things that do, well, I just recently saw the struts. Yes, and I just dude, saw them me, too. Were you at that concert? Dude, I was there. The one at the marquee? Yeah, yeah, That's I was funny. there. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I was there. A good yeah. friend of ours is uh, their sound man, oh, uh, J3. Yeah, yeah, they're really and, good. Dude, not only were they great live, the songs that they have are fantastic. Yeah. That's real songwriting. That's yes. some great stuff. They are they are one of the few rock bands out there kicking ass. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So to see something like that, it's such a pleasure. Yeah. And I think there's a lack of that. Have you heard? There, um, you know what I mean? Have you ever heard the Black Moods? They're a local Phoenix band. They're pretty good. I think. Heard of them? Yes, I have not heard them. You, you okay. know what I mean? Yeah, I, check I, it I, out because yeah, I, I think you might like some of their songs. Um, so speaking of other music, now you you did the you did a movie score for the movie The Monkey King. You've got a solo album where you play the trumpet. Do you have another solo album coming out where you sing? Is that the one you sent me where you're singing and playing the piano? Yeah, that, that that's a new single I've got coming out in September called "With You," and uh, it's. It, I, I don't want to. I don't. You know, it's kind of weird when you talk about your own song. It, it's kind of hard to almost sound disingenuous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I can't wait to just put this out. I just want people to hear it because I yeah. think when they hear it, they're not going to expect this. They who's are this not a, going to. Expect who is the song about? Is it about somebody? Well, <laughs> Can it you is, say? It actually is. Oh. You know, it's kind of weird. This this whole song has been in the making a long time. Oh. And, uh, it, 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 you know, sometimes, yeah, I, I, particularly in this instance in writing a song, the song comes out because you can't help not writing it. It was oh. a very strong feeling for somebody. And, uh, you know, it, 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 although it, and at the end of the day, there's a song that's written about, you know, that that's materialized. Uh-huh. But it doesn't start that way. It starts mm. of just wanting someone to know how you feel. Yeah. So you, you try in everything that you do, you, you if you feel that strongly about it, these sentiments are echoed, you know, in a website that you build, in a letter that you write. And then ultimately, you know, it was I, I needed that person to know so badly that it turned into a song. So it it's over time it's just snowballed. Gotcha. And man, it's about the snowball's about to hit the wall on freaking in September, first week of September. And you got a taste, but that's not even the final mix or oh. everything that's done in the product. So I'm telling you what, when this thing pops, I don't think people are gonna be ready for it. It's 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 different and it's Yeah, you're really putting your heart out there. I don't think, I can, I don't think I they're can... gonna be ready for it. Yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> It's very cool. But yeah, it it it, it came. It, it was written about someone very special to me, and uh, it, uh, it you know echoes the sentiments how I felt at the time. And I think it's. Uh, I, I hope people like it. I really does. Do. She know that the song's I, about her, or well, she she will the first week of September. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You know, so so uh, it's. Uh, do you guys have it's, any? It's, um... uh... <laughs> Sorry, go on. No, no, I'm not. Uh, okay. I'm done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know. It's kind of funny. A lot of people they'll promote. Oh, you got to hear this new song, man! It's gonna knock you to freak out. Uh, you know what? I, I kind of take a different approach. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna make a video to promote it. Yeah. I'm gonna, and uh, it's gonna be a great sound of song. And you know what? I want to sit back. I just want people to see this. When they see it, I won't have to say a word. Perfect. That's, that's you know what I'm so saying. So everybody when will look for pops, that. Yeah. Your, yeah, your website. And maybe some. I, I think some people are gonna be expecting a train wreck. And when they see what actually happens, they're, 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 they're not going to be ready for this. <laughs> I'm excited to, to hear the full thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Do you have any future touring or recording plans for trickster? Like I said, I really enjoyed the last two new albums. Dude, let me tell you something. You know, the, the history of trickster change. I, I remember saying one thing in an interview and then something totally different happened. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that's just, the, that's what happens. That, I mean, that's yeah. but number one, it's part of life. Number two, with these freaking guys, I don't know what this, I, I don't know what to expect. I really don't. Yeah. So I guess anything is a possibility, but I mean, you don't know. I, yeah, I think uh, one good idea we, we talked about the, the blood, sweat and beers reunion sure. 30 years. Let's throw that in, out there. Uh, in, 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 I'm in, man. Yeah. <laughs> So, because I think Steve Steve was touring with Def Leppard, and now I think Steve and uh, PJ are touring with Eric Martin from Mr. Big. I actually saw him at BLK Live a couple months or a few months ago. So, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and you know, everybody's got some kind of project going on. Absolutely. Everybody's got a sideline thing. So, you know, at some point, will it come back together? I don't know. 
Well, I hope I so. Know, I look forward yeah, I mean, to it. I, 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 one, one thing is for sure. When it comes to playing, I love to beat the crap out of the drums. Yeah. And when I do that, I would rather play nothing more than Trickster. Right. So, so you, you don't know, want to I, play I, in I, like I, a cover band or something just for fun? Or... You know, I've had other projects and maybe with the right one, I would consider it. Yeah. But it's got to be the right one. You know, I, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm somewhat selective about that. Sure. But let me tell you something, dude. With this new single I got coming out, I'm curious to see what happens here. And yeah. who knows? I may just have to be some guy pushing everybody out of the way to say I'm first out of the limo. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, you know, I, I don't Take know. Take it on we, tour. We're gonna, yeah, we shall see. We if shall you, uh, see. But well, I'll, you tell you, least, I'll tell you what. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for this to come out because I truly believe a lot of people will not be expecting what yeah, they Yeah, well, and at least you can do a show in Phoenix. You'll have to let me know about that. I'll come and support you and tell everybody well, I'll tell you, you what, I'm going to have a release party and you're invited. So okay. I'll make sure you Absolute. get an invitation. That's very cool. It's going to awesome. be fun. We're going to do a live broadcast. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be cool. a hoopla. So yeah. be- before I let you go here, I did want to bring it. We always try to end up on a positive note or not necessarily a positive note, but try to bring some positivity into the world. So I know that you work with a charity, uh, Hope for Kids International, um, and you yes. said some pretty good things about I like that. The thing that I really liked about you talked about this is that they give 90% of the money actually goes to the kids. It's not like all this, like kind of Red Cross. I think only 10% of the money actually goes to the, the victims or whatever. So tell me more about Hope for Kids International. That's well, you just touched on a very big thing. A lot of people don't necessarily understand when it comes to quote unquote charities, yeah. where the subdivision of money actually goes to. Mm-hmm. And when the idea that the majority of the lion's share doesn't go to the actual cause is a goddamn crime. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's I agree. terrible. And, and you're, you're praying, they put a commercial on with children crying, help the children. This one has been hungry for blah, blah. And, and you know, dude, it's, I'm not saying everything, but a lot of them are a goddamn scam. And that's so freaking horrible. And sometimes they even get celebrities to promote these things. And celebrities don't even know what, what's going on. So one thing I, I really did uh, right out of the box, I tried to get familiar behind the scenes as to what was going on at this particular charity. And uh, it's, I had a friend that actually worked there. And, and they got me in. I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with them right out of the box. Uh-huh. And they show me the work that they were doing. They show me the balance sheet. It's like, wow. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they've been around since like 73. Uh, mm. They do things like dig wells in the Sudan. They, uh, they, they build schools in freaking Indonesia. They take kids that lost their parents and put them through law school. It's like wow. next level stuff, dude. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's crazy. You know, it's, it, and, and like really, and the dude who started it, did it, did it by smuggling Bibles in the seventies to places that didn't have the word of God. You know, it's like huh. he did it with the right sentiments, you know, yeah. he laid a foundation of doing things the right way right. for the right reasons. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that really touched me. And yeah. I thought that was really awesome. And some of the things that they do, you don't hear about this with other charities. I'm like, Holy crap. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Who the hell take the orphan kid and puts him through law school? How freaking crazy yeah. is that? That's, that's great. Amazing. That's amazing you know, that yeah. they have those resources to do that. Really exactly help a lot of people. Correct. So, so, so I, I, you know, I wanted to forge an alliance with them and be a spokesperson for them. And I think what they do is some of the greatest stuff in the world. It, it, they are truly an entity that makes the world a better place. Absolutely. And I, I, I could, I could not help but possibly align my efforts with theirs. I, you know, I, I see them as, 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 as something to offer me direction as to what to do. And 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 I can't tell you how how much it has touched me to touch other people like that. I think it's like the coolest damn thing. Very, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on. I mean, you've, you've done so much and you're, you know, you've had the, the, the gold album, the number one MTV records toured with all the crazy bands. Uh, You've done the solo stuff, the marketing. I mean, is there anything else, the movie score? Um, Is there anything else you want to promote at this time or anything else you want to, that's, that's jogging your memory, any sort of crazy stories that just came to to fruition after we talked or. (laughs) You know, you know what I gotta say. I've been very fortunate, uh, and and you know, I, I when you list everything like that, it sounds like, oh, my, you know, uh, Mark Scott's the greatest guy in the world. But you know, everybody <laughs> has ups and downs in life; sure, they really sure, do. Yeah. And I think as we get older, it's not just about promoting the good stuff and you know trying to hide the bad stuff. Yeah. I think there's a regular line you try to walk on a daily basis, Absolutely. and in making music and doing stuff from this point forward, trying to just be me, you know, yeah. find out who me really is and, and, and just be that. Yeah. And, you know, you don't have to hide bad stuff. You just don't do the bad stuff. What anymore. was the bad, <laughs> what was the bad stuff? 
Well, I mean, the negative things in life, uh, a bad marriage, uh, yeah. not spending enough time with my kids, uh, you know, things on that level, stuff like that. Uh, financial choices, uh, what business to go in, whether to be a solo artist, whether to do a certain record a certain way, what kind of music am I going to be doing? Yeah. You know, what makes me feel great? What, 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 what uh, you know, what, how can I make the world a better place? Absolutely. And how can I be happy in this world? And, that's I, and I think, I, yeah, that's how I look I mean, and maybe, too, yeah. I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't think I would make it this far. I really, I mean, I'm, I, now I look back, I'm 51 years old. I can't even believe I'm saying that. Yeah. I'm 51. Just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was like 26. So I really don't understand what the hell's going on here. No, totally. Uh, you, I, well, I, I, yeah. We want to keep you, we want to keep you around. You know, hopefully you're taking care of yourself. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, it scared me. Uh, the drummer from Twisted Sister just dropped dead in his 50s. And that really scared me. And I was like, wow. That's... Let me tell you, I took lessons from A.J. Pirro in 88. And oh. he was, uh, he, he was, he, first off, I as a player, a lot of people don't know how fantastic a freaking player he really was. I mean, right. drummers know, and he was very well respected. He had a combination of not only finesse, but freaking raw power. And when you put those two elements together, it, it becomes a deadly combination. He was a son of a bitch to be reckoned with. Yeah. So I knew AJ quite, quite well. And uh, the, when his pass, I saw him not too long before he passed also. Oh. So when I heard about it, I was like, oh, and he passed away not far from my hometown. So oh, it geez. was a weird, damn, yeah, really a very strange thing. But yeah. uh, I loved him, and yeah, believe me, like I think about that, and I talk, I'm good friends with Wild McBrown from Doc, and yeah. we talk about this sort of thing because honestly, yeah, we like to go out and have fun. We don't always take care of ourselves, and then you know the idea of not taking care of yourself, running out to go play a show for an hour and a half, <laughs> and you're not, you, you, you got to watch that shit. Yeah. You really do. Yeah, we're getting Particularly old when so. you're used to just snapping it out like that. Now I'm 51 goddamn years old. Yeah, right. you, you flirt with a dangerous thing if you're going to play that trick. Drumming so. is pretty physically intense, right? I mean, it's kind of like a workout. It's well, not like if you're just... gonna play. If you're going to play butt rock, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was but, a solely yeah. Seattle term. I'm still fascinated that no one else knows I, about it. It's I, interesting. I don't know. I, I think it probably was. But yeah. I mean, all kidding aside, yeah, if you're going to play high energy music yeah. and you're not going to just sit back and, you no. know, be Gene Krupa, you're right. going to get a freaking, you know, you want to smash. I mean, I'm a guy. I like to smash the living crap out of these things. Absolutely. And I don't, you know, so yeah, I mean, it is of genuine concern, Absolutely. particularly getting older and you don't take care of yourself. You certainly run the risk of hurting yourself. And it's really, you know, yeah, yeah, you got to watch your ass. That's for so sure. just take care of yourself. And uh, I hope to see a trickster reunion soon. And uh, I'm looking forward to the solo stuff. So this is going to be great. Anything else you want to, say before we no, all I say is thank you i mean honestly mm. I, I think i don't get to say it enough uh which actually would be nothing without support of the people yeah it's the people that you know make the choice as to what shows they go to what records they buy and you know the, i gotta tell you social media wise the kind of stuff uh, you know the fan base is still growing mm -hmm. and uh, I, i'm i i'm just about full on my second Facebook personal page and you know it's like oh, yeah. it's it, it, it god bless it's uh you know, you know there, there's people that still care there's still interest in what's going on and what's happening for the future so I, all I can say is thank you yeah you know, well thank past, you so much for being my guest and taking the time um to That's do my little show my, here thank you for having me and I'll okay. tell you what when it comes to this uh my single release party you're getting an invitation okay my friend. I can't wait uh, yeah I can't wait to be there I'll, I'll be there for sure God bless you. Thanks right. so much. Thanks Greg. so I much, really Mark. Do. All right. Goodbye. Okay. So that was uh, Mark Gus Scott from Trickster. Wow. I just feel like, uh, wow. It was just like a whirlwind. So many ups and downs and uh, just some great stories to tell. So if you like this podcast, um, please let a friend know. If you hate it, tell an enemy. Um, but like, uh, you can like, uh, my page or you can friend me on Facebook. You can uh, follow me on Instagram. Uh, I think I'm going to create a Facebook page probably so that you can, uh, and hopefully we'll have a website soon where all these interviews will be on the website. Um, I also do another podcast, the Chuck and Josh podcast. We have about 48 episodes. There's a few interviews on there as well. Um, so you can find out that page on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. So, um, all right, that's it until next time. Goodbye.